Welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm Corey, your host, and this is the episode for the week starting May 21st, 2012. In many of my security presentations over the past few years, I've warned that attackers are increasingly leveraging social networks like Facebook to spread their malware. So let's start this week's news with two Facebook-related malware variants. The first is rather simple and doesn't actually directly exploit any problems with Facebook. Instead, it leverages the trust that users have in Facebook to get them to click a malicious link. This particular malware will arrive as an email message that pretends to be a Facebook cancellation notice. Of course, it asks you to follow a link if you'd like to find out why your account's being canceled or how to stop it. Now, if you follow this link, it's going to take you to an attacker page, and this attacker page is going to try to forcefully install some software on your computer. You'll get some pop-ups basically saying that you need an updated version of Flash to see the page. Now, of course, you do not want to say okay to this pop-up because the page is really trying to install malware on your machine, not Flash. Uh, the page does make it hard uh, to get away from, though, because they do aggressively repeat this pop-up even if you say no, so you may have to close your browser. In any case, if you get any emails from Facebook in the next few weeks warning you about cancellation, definitely don't click any links in those actual emails. If you really are worried about your Facebook account, I would go to Facebook manually using your browser. This week's second Facebook-related malware variant was actually discovered by one of our AV partners, Kaspersky, and it can actually spread directly on Facebook and is quite technically interesting. Kaspersky resellers found a piece of malware that actually exploits a legitimate uh, cross-browser extension API. Uh, this is an API called CrossWriter. It was developed so that web developers can create extensions for browsers including Chrome, uh, Firefox, and Internet Explorer so that one extension can work across all different browsers. And by extension, this also means it can work on all kinds of different OSs and platforms since these browsers run on all those platforms as well. So this malware author used this legitimate uh, CrossRider API to create a piece of malware which he calls LilyJade, which is capable of installing on any of these three different browsers on any platform. Uh, once it infects your browser as an extension, it will then monitor your Facebook connections and then try to update your Facebook status uh, with links that actually, they I think they claim something about Justin Bieber in a car crash, but of course they point to sites that are designed to deliver this malware to your friends as well. So far, the malware seems to be designed for click fraud. It will start to put a lot of ads in your browsing experience, which generate money for the attackers. According to some, the LilyJade uh, malware is a little harder for antivirus to detect because it doesn't come down as an executable file like normal malware. Again, it's a browser extension. That said, many AV companies have updated their programs to detect it. So to protect yourself, be sure you're running up-to-date antivirus both on your client machines and on your gateway devices, such as our XTM appliances, and also be careful where you click online. Another big story this week is yet another chink in the armor of RSA's Secure ID token algorithm. If you haven't heard of Secure ID before, it's an encryption algorithm created by RSA to help provide two token authentication. To explain it non-technically, RSA's Secure ID algorithm should generate very, very unique numbers that change over time. And the numbers are unique to your device, whether that be a physical token that you actually get from RSA, or whether it actually be the device you're running RSA software on on your computer, uh, which has its own seeds to generate these numbers unique to that device. Well, this week a story came out that a researcher has figured out how to clone the actual software running on a computing device if you're using RSA's Secure ID software on your laptop computer. Uh, basically, he figured out how to crack some of the copy protection 
in RSA's uh, Secure ID software so that he could actually pull the seed data used for that device. He could then put that seed data on a different machine, clone a copy of that machine, and then generate the exact same tokens as that one other device does. This of course defeats the whole purpose of Secure ID, which is supposed to give specific devices very, very unique one-time pads which you can use for two-token authentication. Now, unfortunately, this is the second time uh, Secure ID from RSA has had problems. As you probably remember, earlier last year, RSA was actually breached by some attackers who gained access to the seeding data that RSA uses for their actual hardware tokens as well. Now, none of this means that Secure IDs don't work anymore. Uh, this just means that a researcher who has access to your computer and your Secure ID software may be able to clone your laptop. But of course, if you protect your computer, this won't happen. Uh, the researcher does warn that if you get malware on your computer, he could also steal the keys via that malware. So you do definitely want to protect your machine. So my simple advice to you, if you use RSA Secure ID software, be sure to protect your computer or laptop which runs it. Uh, make sure it runs uh, firewalls, it has antivirus, or it's behind a protected network, and do your best to keep malware off it. So I haven't mentioned Anonymous much over the past few weeks, but unfortunately this week there was a newsworthy enough breach from an Anonymous-related group that I do have to bring them up. Uh, this week, uh, Anonymous-related attackers claim to have breached uh, USA's Department of Justice. We don't know much about this breach yet. Uh, the Department of Justice is still trying to research it to see how it happened. But what we do know is this Anonymous group has posted a 1.7 gigabyte file to the Pirate Bay. Uh, they claim the contents of this file includes a lot of Department of Justice email, as well as the entire database for their website. Now, I personally have haven't downloaded this particular torrent, which is probably not a good thing to do anyways, so I can't attest to what's in there. But many others have claimed that the file does contain what these attackers claim it does. So it does seem clear that they were able to get some sort of unauthorized access to the Department of Justice website. Without knowing exactly how Anonymous pulled off this breach, I can only generalize some security tips. In the past, uh, these type of attackers tend to use a lot of web application flaws, whether it be cross-site scripting, SQL injection, or local and remote file inclusion. These are all flaws that have to do with your web developer not creating secure code, or perhaps having misconfigurations on your web server. Uh, so if you are a web administrator or a web developer out there, make sure to go to sites like OWASP.org to learn how you can create secure web code and avoid these type of web application flaws. So let's finish off this week's news with a quick tool tip. In the past, I've uh, recommended different security software, and this week I want to recommend Nmap6. Now, if you're watching this, you've probably heard of Nmap before. It's a very, very popular port scanner, uh, but it goes well beyond port scanning. A port scanner, by the way, is a, a piece of software that can scan an uh, internet device or your network to see what ports are open on all the devices on your network. This can help you find out what services are running on your different computers. It can even help you find out what devices you actually have on your network. Uh, on top of that, Nmap goes well beyond port scanning. It it has some passive OS and service fingerprinting capability that can tell you a little bit about all these different devices. One well, map's been around for a while. If you haven't used it, I recommend you check it out. But this week they announced Nmap 6, the latest revision of Nmap. Uh, the biggest feature to this new version is it now supports fully IPv6 port scanning as well. So if you're interested in testing and playing around with IPv6 networks, which you should be over the next few years, I'd highly recommend you check out Nmap. Well, that covers the news this week. I hope you found this week's podcast informative. Remember, if you like more regular security stories, be sure to follow our blog, WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com, or you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept. Next week, I'll be traveling again to our European Partner Conference. So like last week, uh, the podcast may go up a little later or earlier next week, but it will come out. Thanks for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Thank <laughs> you.